I'm Salvatore Babonis, and today's lecture is American Tian Sha, State and Self at the End of History. The German philosopher George Hegel famously wrote that the history of the world is nothing but the development of the idea of freedom. And in contrast to Hobbes and his theory of the Leviathan, Hegel thought that freedom could only truly be developed in the context of society and ultimately in the context of the modern nation state. He wrote, self-consciousness in the form of social disposition has its substantive freedom, its substantive freedom in the state as the essence, purpose, and product of its activity. Um, we can have a ridiculous freedom out in the wild in a Rousseauian sense to do what we want, but in any real substantive way to have freedom is to have freedom within society, and that's only possible under the state. His disciple, late disciple, uh, Alexander Pojev, uh, developed Hegel's philosophy of the right into the idea of the universal homogeneous state, uh, the state that is universal in its jurisdiction and internally homogeneous with no distinctions uh, within, uh, no distinctions among classes or groups of people within the state itself. And again, Kojev thought this was the, the place where people could truly develop as individuals uh, if they were inside a state that had no internal conflict and no external conflict, a state that was based on uh, solely the membership the, of the individual within it. Ultimately, this led to Francis Fukuyama and the end of history. Now, Francis Fukuyama thought that the end of history was liberal democracy plus VCRs and stereos, but he located that within Pojev's Hegelian universal homogeneous state. He said, we might summarize the content of the universal homogeneous state as liberal democracy in the political sphere combined with easy access to VCRs and stereos in the economic. Now, Fukuyama may have been uh, no great futurist when it comes to technology, uh, but he was and is a great political thinker. Remember, he wrote those words in early 1989, before Tiananmen Square, before the fall of the Berlin Wall, before the victory of solidarity in Poland. In fact, two years before the breakup of the Soviet Union. He was prescient well before his time. Now, maybe it takes a Russian to fully comprehend uh, the importance of the, the fall of the Soviet Union and the, the victory of liberal democracy. Look to Alexander Dugan. When liberalism transforms from being an ideological arrangement to being the only content of our extant social and technological existence, then it is no longer an ideology, but an existential fact, an objective order of things. So where Fukuyama, the liberal, uh, was reluctant to claim uh, any true universality for liberalism, he thought that liberalism would be contained within a country. Dugan, the arch enemy of liberalism, sees liberalism as something that impacts uh, the entire world, not just uh, within any particular state container. In other words, the universal homogeneous state at the end of history is not just liberal democracy within any individual country and VCRs and stereos in the economic sphere. The universal homogeneous state is a new Tian Sha. Uh, Tian Sha is the Chinese term for you know, all under heaven. Uh, Tian Sha depicts an enlightened realm that Confucian thinkers and Mandarins raised to one of universal values that determined who was civilized and who was not. Now, the Chinese Tian Sha of the Ming and Qing dynasty may have been a Confucian Tian Sha, but the American Tian Sha is unavowedly a liberal Tian Sha. As Wang Gungwu said, today an American Tian Sha has a strong global presence. It has a missionary drive that is backed by unmatched military power and political influence. Compared to the Chinese concept, it is not passive and defensive. Rather, unlike other universal ideals, it is supported by a greater capacity to expand. The United States may not expand, 
But the American Tian Sha, the liberal postmodern individual, is expanding to cover the entire world. As the U.S. Declaration of Independence said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is the creed, the ideology of the 21st century American Tian Sha. The American Tian Sha is, is the universal homogeneous state. Fukuyama was looking for in 1989, but did not find. Fukuyama thought that the best that could come out of a universal state would be something like the European Union. In fact, we live in a true universal state, that of an American, an overarching American Tian Sha. Now, by that, I don't mean that the United States of America has taken over the world. Far from it. The United States of America is merely the central state, the Zhongguo, in the larger American Tian Sha. The, the two characters, Zhongguo, mean China in Chinese, uh, often translated as Middle Kingdom. They literally mean central state. In the Confucian Chinese Tian Sha, China didn't rule the entire East Asian world. China was the central state of an ideological system that embraced uh, that was embraced by their entire world. America's ideological system is a system of postmodern liberalism. It's not uh, Confucianism. It's a different philosophy, but it performs the same function in the American world that Confucianism historically performed in the Ming and Qing dynasties of the Chinese Tian Sha. Now, many, many of us identify postmodernism with uh, post-World War II uh, French philosophers, but in fact, the person who coined the term postmodernism was Arnold Toynbee, the British world historian, and he located postmodernism as beginning after the Civil War in the United States of America, or approximately 100 years after the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence was a, a, a wholly postmodern document in its aspiration that every individual, not just great men and politicians and scientists, but that every individual had uh, rights to freedom and the pursuit of happiness. And although that was not immediately operationalized in America, after the Civil War, uh, there was uh, coming to fruition a cult of the individual. We can see it in war memorializations. Here's the State of New York Monument at Gettysburg uh, National Battlefield. The State of New York Monument has a plinth, but who's on top of it? Not the governor of New York, not the general, uh, General McClellan, um, the person at the the figure at the top of the uh, column is a metaphorical, a metaphorical figure of the state of New York holding a wreath for the fallen heroes of New York State, and you can't see it in the photo, but crying tears down her cheek. Also invisible in the photo are the inscriptions of the names of the citizens of New York who fell in battle at Gettysburg. In other words, there is a memorialization of the individual soldier, not of the general or the politician. And that theme runs through American memorials uh, after the Civil War. In fact, Memorial Day, the United States Remembrance Day, began in the 1870s as Decoration Day, the day for decorating the graves of those who had fallen in the Civil War. And it's not just one monument, there are hundreds of monuments uh, this one is particularly poignant, the 136th New York Infantry, uh, a monument of a, a, a tree stump cut off, uh, you know, symbolizing the, the soldiers who were struck down uh, in the prime of life with a soldier's kit, a, a drum, a, a leather bag, a rifle leaning against the stump. And again, on the back of the monument, the names of the individual soldiers who died at Gettysburg. And we could go on and on, monument after monument. Here is the muse of history, 
recording the names of the fallen into the scroll of history, again, accompanied by a list of soldiers who died in the battle. A particularly poignant uh, memorial, this is a uh, depiction of the flag boy uh, who was shot down in, in at the very beginning of the battle, you know, holding the banner, holding the flag. Um, it's not the regiment commander who's memorialized, it's the boy who held the flag who's memorialized. And again, on the back, the names of all of the fallen. Even the war correspondents of the Civil War got a memorial. This is one of my famous favorites. It's actually uh, just outside Antietam Battlefield. And it's an arch to the war correspondents, the reporters who suffered and died reporting the Civil War. These kind of monuments only appeared in the Anglo rest of the Anglo-Saxon world, in Britain and Australia, maybe a little after the Boer War, and certainly after World War I. Australians and uh, British will be familiar with the lists of the dead. Um, if you look at Napoleonic memorials in the UK, you find you know, Nelson uh, atop his column. Uh, if you look at World War I monuments, good luck finding a general on horseback with a saber drawn. They're just not there. The World War I monument, monuments are monuments to individual people. That kind of postmodernity, postmodernity as the democratization of individuality started in the Anglo-Saxon world, specifically in America, spread to Western Europe, and arguably only in the 1960s uh, spread to continental Europe, and only in the 1990s to Eastern Europe and parts of Asia. The democratization of individuality, the postmodern individual, is the leitmotif of the American Tiansha. It runs through the uh, not just the culture, but the, the ideology, the understanding of the world that arose in America in the late 19th century and is now spreading certainly to elites and even spreading down to ordinary people uh, throughout the world. Nobody wants to die for the emperor anymore. Nobody wants to die for communism. Nobody even wants to die for democracy. Uh, people want to live, to live out their own lives, uh, to, uh, to flourish in the pursuit of individual happiness. That is the heart, the leitmotif of the American Tian Sha. In the postmodern American Tian Sha, every individual participates directly in a single global sovereignty, uh, that of not exactly the United States, but a sovereignty of the American system. That is, every postmodern individual has a stake in the stability and perpetuation of the American Tian Sha. Uh, here's a, a famous internet meme of a Chinese student graduating from Harvard Business School holding aloft the two things he presumably most values in the world, the Chinese flag and the American dollar. Will this student, will this man ever go on to advocate the invasion of America and the overthrow of the capitalist system? I think not. Returning to Hegel, Hegel said the history of the world is nothing but the development of the idea of freedom. Hegel thought that freedom could only be realized in the context of the state. But maybe Hegel didn't anticipate that one day the entire world would become, in effect, a single state, a single political entity with a, a single set of, uh, of political norms. After all, Hegel said, America is the land of the future, where in ages that lie before us, the burdens of the world his world's history will reveal itself. Hegel was aware that he didn't know exactly where America was going to lead, but that wherever it led was going to become the future of the world. And I think we've already arrived there at the global American Tian Sha, an in effect, a global state that encompasses uh, all of the smaller, more local polities of the world. 
To find out more, you can listen to my fuller one-hour lecture available on my YouTube channel. You can also find me at salvatorbabonis.com, where you can sign up for my monthly newsletter on global affairs.